Hi you guys, um, I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Uh, I'm gonna try to be a little bit more consistent with these videos. Uh, I noticed I, I took a week off, I had a little bit of a... I don't want to call it a break because I really enjoy filming these videos, but I had a little bit of a time where my life kind of shifted a little bit and then I just was doing other things and I'm back. <laughs> so today I just wanted to talk about Rudbeckia hirta. This over here is the dwarf variety. It's in the Asteraceae family, cold hardy to, well actually there's different cold hardinesses across the board with this plant. Um, this one here is a dwarf variety, it's the bronze autumnal series. And it has a mature height of about a foot, a mature spread of about two feet, uh, which is significantly smaller than the more perennializing, larger established varieties of black-eyed Susans, which are more like three and a half to four feet tall and a spread of about three and a half to four feet. Um, those ones there, I'll, I'll probably make a really short video because there's a little patch in this little alleyway that I walk by every once in a while. And I'll probably just film that one later just to show you guys. It's a little bit different anatomically and its cold hardiness is a little bit different too, but they're quite similar. So a few tips that I have for this plant is uh, placement. So it looks really good in containers and at the entranceways of gardens and especially the dwarf varieties, they look really good in borders and in mixed perennial cottage gardens. So now these guys here are tender perennials, which basically means that they will come back for a couple of years with optimal care, but they fade out quite um, soon and they're just not really long-lived plants. So don't expect these guys to live for like multiple um, decades or anything like that, unless you regularly propagate like uh, stem tip cuttings and then you can rejuvenate them that way. But for the most part, they're just a couple of a year type of a thing. And they're also quite hard to grow by seed, so I highly recommend getting nursery stock that's already uh, into its blooming phase if you really want that pop of color throughout the season. So I just really wanted to talk about a few of the do's and don'ts of this plant. This one here is another one that I just got in the clearance section of the store. It's had kind of rough days. It has a little bit of generative new growth coming up, but I think with a little bit of tender love and care, it'll probably bounce back for me. Um, so some of the don'ts. So this one here has um, soil that's really quite wet and just saturated and members of the Asteraceae family, which includes all sorts of daisies and coneflowers, uh, don't necessarily like having soils that don't drain readily. So they don't like having wet feet. Another thing I did notice when I purchased these two plants is this one here, the really kind of stately fleshy one, was in a way sunnier location than the one that needs a little bit of help. So they need a whole lot of sun. So these guys here thrive in seven, eight, even nine hours of direct sunlight a day. I have a pretty sunny location. We had some rain here, but it should be fine. Um, they are heavy feeders when they get into blooming, but once they've started blooming, uh, it kind of weans off and they don't really require a whole lot of excess feeding or anything like that. Um, you might get a little bit of fertilizer burn or even like browning if you use even a well diluted uh, liquid fertilizer while they're well into blooming. So I think with a lot of tender perennials a lot of people tend to think more fertilizer, more potash, more um, calcium and these types of nutrients are better because they really try to promote the growth of flowers but I don't think this plant here necessarily needs that very much. Uh, it tends to fare well on its own. It blooms all throughout the summer. It blooms well into autumn. I'm probably going to have these into October and a really interesting thing about these plants is sometimes their bloom color will actually change with the changing temperature. So you get a little bit of kind of a red or orange tinge to them later into the season, uh, into September and October. So they get a little bit more variegation. So one thing I recommend to get more blooms off of these plants and just to really make them a centerpiece for your neighbors um, and just really kind of make people go wow at your garden display is to get a good pair of secateurs. I highly recommend sanitizing them between plants uh, just to avoid the spread of disease such as botrytis and just finding a point of origin within the plant. These are anvil tips by the way. Um, and then just cutting right back to the origin of one of those spent blooms and you'll find that you'll get a whole lot more blooms and it just reinvigorates the plant. So I cut these below the capitulum, below the calyx, right at an internode uh, where there's new leaves emerging. I think this one here is a pretty good example here. Right flush with a new leaf. And that just reinvigorates them. So if you're going to grow them as a perennial, try to put them in the place that doesn't go below, I want to say, 
two degrees Celsius, a little bit above freezing, especially with the dwarf varieties because I find it exhausts them. And the frost heaving is just really bad for their fibrous roots. Uh, you can move them indoors or right out by a porch or like just by your doorstep uh, for the winter months to protect them a bit and you might get a few more years out of them. But that just mainly refers to just the dwarf varieties because the larger, more perennializing varieties tend to do a whole lot better. So those are just some of my tips for this plant. Uh, they're native to Central North America. They've been uh, naturalized elsewhere, such as in the Orient, uh, Korean Peninsula, even into the plains of North America, into the Midwest a little bit. So they're quite uh, tough, but yeah. I just think it's a really good plant to just put at the entryway. It blooms well into fall, and I think everybody should be growing it. It's a little bit fragrant, but not too fragrant. It kind of has a sunflowery kind of leaf-like smell. It's not very edible. I, I know people have said that it is edible and it's good for your immune system, but personally, through my own research of this plant, I think it causes more harm than good for the system. It's very fibrous and hard to digest, so I do not recommend eating it. And yeah, uh, put a lot of vermiculite and perlite into the soil to aid into that drainage, especially if you have them growing in containers. And yeah, so that's my introduction to Rudbeckias or Black-Eyed Susans or Black-Eyed Susies. And they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and they're just beautiful. Um, if you get a little bit of blight on the leaves, I highly recommend misting with a little bit of 2% or skim milk. Uh, it tends to act as an antifungicide and then it subdues that infection. Yeah, so those are, there are just some of my little tips on how to grow this plant, and I hope you guys have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for the support. You guys are beautiful. And yeah, just be happy, and remember to spread a bit of kindness out there, you guys. Okay, stay blessed.